the World Nomads podcast bonus episode. Here amazing nomads sharing their knowledge, stories and experience of world travel. Thank you for tuning in to this amazing nomads episode. It's the latest in our bonus series. It sits alongside our destination podcast and highlights those travelers who demonstrate discovery, connection, transformation, fear, and all love. I think I've learnt those off by heart. They go through my head each time I hit the pillow at night. There you go. Uh, look, James Buckman is a documentary and editorial photographer who says he's inspired by the mountains and the sea. Who isn't? Uh, he was born and raised on an ostrich farm in rural Pennsylvania. Wait a minute, an ostrich farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I've got to say, he has a tendency to live on the grittier side of life, doesn't he? Kim? Yeah, he certainly does. And at the moment, he's living off his 96 DR650, riding from Alaska to Patagonia. Now, I was really interested in him after reading this book called Hit the Road, Vans, Nomads and Roadside Adventures. It's a beautiful hardback book, but it's about travellers that love road tripping, but it's kind of the off the beaten track adventures, as the name suggests. Um, and it also has tips on how to kit your van out or whatever you're travelling in, food to cook while on the road, and just flicking through it, it's actually totally inspiring, has me thinking. And James, you did it in an orange VW camper van. <laughs> in a 76 camper van, yep. Did you give it a name? Did you personify it? I did, actually. Yeah, go on. Yeah, I... I named it Melody, and that's her first name, and her last name is Bark Van. So my <laughs> last name is Bark Man. So I thought it only fitting to, of course, name her Melody Bark Van. So that's her name. Beautiful. You found it on Craigslist, but I've got a girlfriend who has one that she's named Gidget, and Gidget is always breaking down. What about Melody? <laughs> Uh, I would say the same for Melody, for sure. <laughs> when I actually bought her on Craigslist, she broke down on the way home. I had about a three-and-a-half-hour <laughs> drive. And at the time, I really knew nothing about vans. Um, I wanted to learn, of course, but I had no experience. And she broke down and let me set for quite a few hours. And <laughs> I had no idea what to do. But I think I it kind of... It was only it was only right that she broke down right away because there's been countless others. <laughs> Seriously, if you want to learn about motor vehicle maintenance, get a VW camper van. Yeah, and learn very quickly. I call it Zen and the art of Volkswagen maintenance. Yep. <laughs> because I mean, I'm sure we're all familiar with the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, yep. but it really teaches you so much more about, you know, the actual mechanics. It teaches you patience and you know, just kind of ingenuity and all of that. So and, and how I'm to, grateful and, for that. Sure. And how to swear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I've had uh, quite a few frustrating times with her. All right. Now, let's. can we just leap back a bit in the story uh, about you and Melody? So you, you were living in Pennsylvania when you, uh, when you bought the camper van and you had this idea of going over to the west coast of America. D just tell us about that. Where did that idea come from? Why were you motivated to do that? Um, I think it's kind of gr – growing up in the States in like a small rural area of Pennsylvania, it's kind of like – the american dream to just go west you know and do and do a big road trip and i think as long as i can remember i was like i'm gonna grow up and i'm gonna you know grab a whole bunch of buddies and buy an old rickety van or something and just drive west and see what happens and as i got older um i found the van you know got interested in in volkswagens got the van and all of a sudden i was like wait i can actually do this and not just keep talking about it but i can hop in and drive west. So that's more or less what I did. Um, and I think, yeah, there's kind of like when growing up on the East coast of the States, there's kind of this allure to the West coast <laughs> and it definitely attracted me. And yeah, I kind of picked up and left off and have been living out there ever since for the most part. It's, we've watched a video of you um, driving Melody and there are some pretty challenging weather conditions as well. But I note that, um, in the book, Phil, he's come uh, overcome those. James, you've got a potbelly stove inside Melody. <laughs> yes, I do. Is that not dangerous? Like, no, do you get no, smoked he's, out? No, no, no. He's, he's also got... Yeah, tell us how you adapt it, but you've got an exhaust, so the smoke goes outside of Yeah, and look, the, the smoke's going into his, directly back into his van. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that the case? Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, it is. I don't actually know if it's legal. I never really found out. I've been stopped a couple times by cops, and they were kind of always surprised by it, but I've never gotten in trouble. So as far as legality goes, I guess I've, I think it's legal. <laughs> but as practically speaking, I mean, it's, it kind of just started as an idea. Um, when I moved into my van, it was just, I mean, the East Coast winters get really cold, and I didn't want to deal with propane heat because it's a little dangerous with, like, the poisoning. Yeah. And I didn't have electricity or anything like that. So I was like, man, I'll just get a wood stove. That would work perfectly. And it kind of just started from there. So I found the wood stove on Craigslist as well, <laughs> only fitting that I that I did, and kind of just put it in. And it's been in there ever since. So it's kept me warm many a cold night. Well, we're going to steal some pictures out of that book, and so that people can see <laughs> how the how the stuff works and how you've got a proper sort of you know exhaust system going on it. So I'm I'm pretty sure. But listen, tell us a bit about that. I mean, um, I know from watching the film that you were. Uh, you know, you had a regular job in a mechanical workshop, but you decided that wasn't the life for you. Yes, absolutely. I I think it's important to have, um, you know, in different seasons of life, to have stability and, you know, financial stability and things like that. And at the time I was working the job, I knew it was valuable and I wanted to save money and learn different skills and things like that. But I knew that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. It was kind of more of a means to a next step. And so I worked that job for a few years, uh, quite a few years. And then when I had saved a lot of money and kind of had more of an idea of what I wanted to do when I quit, I kind of just put in my notice and quit and drove west. <laughs> and and, what, so, and yeah. what you wanted to do was photography and documentary making, right? Definitely. And I, I view myself as more of a creative and an artist and photography is more of the medium that I'm working with right now. And I think that can kind of change, you know, throughout the journey of life. Um, but as of now, I'm definitely interested in photography and do a lot of documentary work. Correct. I was pretty excited to hear that Chris Burkhardt is one of your mentors and I follow uh, Chris on Instagram. He's got millions of followers. Uh, how inspirational yeah. has he been to you with your, um, your photography and your documentary making? Oh uh, yeah. Chris has helped me out in so many ways. Not only is he a great mentor, but he's a great friend as well. And I owe a lot of, where I am and what I know to Chris and he's definitely kind of bent over backwards to to help me in many different times so that was that was definitely a big step as far or in terms of my career and um, yeah that was actually one of the reasons I moved out west in the first place and I actually went directly to um, an apprenticeship with Chris so that was that was kind of a great step um, in my personal journey you you make it sound like that was kind of you know a planned step, but in the in the film in the documentary, you're quite adamant about people actually um, not planning too much and making the leap first as a philosophy. Definitely, um, I think it's like it's a very fine balance, and I think um, everyone kind of pendulums to one side or the other, and I'm guilty of that as well. But I think before. When I kind of came up with the, that whole philosophy, I think I was a little too far on the other side, like too much stability and, you know, too much um, just monotony. And I was like, man, I want to be free. I want to live without regrets. And but I also want to be responsible and not kind of throw everything out the window. So, yeah, I, I really believe in spontaneity and kind of just not um, living in a box. Per se, so <laughs> it's definitely an important philosophy in my life. Yeah, that's that's a lot of people I know is you know their inspiration to travel is exactly that. They don't want to be inside that box. They've got to do something different to explore. Yeah, and he's exploring right now, which we'll get to in a minute. But I, I want to just get back to that road trip and give us a few of the stories that you experienced along the way. That I mean, we've talked about the weather, we've talked about melody breaking down. Um, what else did you encounter that you could share? Uh, on that specific road trip, we actually got stuck a few times. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of rain. Um, you have a really nice summer season, but for the most part, it's raining and sometimes snowing throughout the year. 
And also in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of forest roads, which are kind of just trails that lead out into the woods and to the mountains. And those are often super muddy. So one night when we were camping, um, sometimes you don't really have a map and you don't really have, you're not really following any directions. You kind of just meander down trails and sometimes it's a dead end or it's overgrown. It hasn't been um, up or driven in, in years. So this one night we, we drove down a road and we got incredibly stuck. It probably took us three hours to get out and we didn't have um, any, I mean, we didn't have like any pulley systems or anything or, or uh, winches. So we kind of just manhandled it out. And that's, that's like a big part actually of, of living on the road, I think is just kind of following that spontaneity. It's like, you don't really go to, to formal campsites. You don't really go to the campgrounds. You kind of just drive into the woods and see what happens. And sometimes you get stuck. Sometimes I've been stuck for, you know, almost a week at times before, but thankfully that night we were able to get out. <laughs> so what did you learn? I mean, a, a boy from rural Pennsylvania, now you're in the Pacific Northwest. What do you think you learned from that, that first trip you were doing? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it was kind of like a maiden voyage for me. There was a lot of unknown. I wasn't really established as far as my career, what I wanted to do. I was kind of just figuring things out. I mean, I was only 21 years old. And, I mean, the van broke down quite a few times in Utah. It actually almost burned uh, one night. <laughs> uh, there was an oil leak in the back, and it was dripping onto the exhaust, which got really hot. And we actually got completely smoked out. We had to stop and couldn't see, couldn't breathe in the van. And so things like that happening and, and just you know, meeting people along the way, breaking down, meeting people that help you out, it was kind of just like... I don't know. It, it, it was kind of just addicting in a sense that the thrill of the unknown, it's like, man, is this van going to drive 3,500 miles from the east to west coast? Like, I don't know. But all that that thrill and that sense of unknown was addicting. And, and it was also just, it was also challenging, like in a mental sense. Um, and I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it shaped a lot of, of who I am and what I do, I think. Well, we, it's great to have you because in this book you talk about garaging Melody in, uh, it was last year actually, and getting a 1996 Suzuki DR650 and your plans to go from Alaska to Argentina and also climb every major peak along the way. So we've caught you during that. What? Where are you and what have you done? <laughs> so I'm currently in Peru and um, just a few days ago, me and my buddies, I'm traveling with two other friends. We just left this um, this town called Juarez in Peru, and it's essentially known as the Chamonix of the Andes, and it's surrounded by these 20,000-foot or 6,000-meter mountains in every direction. So we were actually there for the last three months just climbing as much as we could, and um, yeah, now we're back on the road heading into Bolivia and on our way to Patagonia. So you did catch me about... Definitely over halfway now, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been an adventure. Can I can I ask you how you got past the Darien Gap if you're riding? I know a lot of people want to do that north to south thing, but the Darien Gap, you know, as the name suggests, is a gap that's um, not only impassable but dangerous to attempt. How did you get? Did you catch a boat around it? What did you do? Yeah, we actually did. Um, it's definitely probably the hardest thing logistically. Um, to do with a trip like this but essentially we loaded our bikes into a shipping container and shipped it from panama to colombia and there's it's it's kind of a ghetto process i mean the paperwork is a little sketchy it's it's you sometimes you get stuck and you have to wait for three weeks while your boat is somewhere so that's more or less what we did and we caught a plane into Colombia and then waited for our bikes to get shipped in on the container. Are, so it would have been awesome to drive the Darien but like you said it's no, more or less impossible. No, no, no <laughs> not recommended at all. Hey, but there are probably worse places to be stuck than Colombia, right? That's supposed to be awesome. Yeah, it is an awesome country, but with the town that we were stuck in was Cartagena and it's really really hot. Like the probably the the hottest place I've ever been in. <laughs> So that wasn't exactly the most enjoyable time. But, I mean, it's not the worst place, like you said. Once you've reached Argentina then, what's next, James? 
Um, I'm definitely thinking about it. Um, there's a lot of opportunity and ideas. Uh, practically speaking, I want to pursue more documentary work, so I'm hoping to go back to Afghanistan um, post-trip on a project. I was there uh, actually right before I left on this motorcycle trip. And as I said, I'm a photographer as well, so I'll be doing you know, different projects. But my one of my greatest passions is climbing, so I would hope to um, kind of maybe climb in, in the Alps or or a, the Alaska range or the Himalayas. So I'm kind of figuring that all out. So I'm kind of juggling my career with my passions, and sometimes they blend together, which is great, but that's kind of the, the tentative plans post-trip. Do you see this as, you know, this is your life now forever, or do you think there may be a period when this is not really possible anymore? Um, it's I think about sustainability a lot and what I'm doing now it's I don't want to just, you know, do it for a few years and then go work uh in a cubicle for the rest of my life. Um I I want to climb the rest of my life. I want to shoot the rest of my life and I think in throughout different seasons things can look very differently, you know, whether you have a family, whether, you know, you have career commitments, whatnot. But for the most part like those core values of um just living, you know, with uh, just with like risk and, and without regrets and it, with spontaneity, I want to always kind of keep those near and dear. And hopefully I'll continue to do things like this the rest of my life. <laughs> so I, I definitely don't think of it as kind of like a, a short season. Hopefully it'll it'll be sustainable throughout yeah, the rest of my life. That you can at least weave into the rest of your life as well. Uh, speaking of risk, definitely. apart from climbing, um, you know, electricity power poles. <laughs> Which you'll see in his video. <laughs> Which you'll see in the video. Um, uh, but, sorry, but how do you, yeah, I know. I, you, I get the thrill, all right. But do you manage that risk as well? Do you sort of like go, mm, maybe, maybe not this time? Absolutely. Um, we actually just came back from a climb in the Andes, and it was a nine day expedition. We were kind of way out in the mountains, and we were at the base camp of this climb that we wanted to do called Alpha Mile. It's a beautiful mountain. You should Google it, it's, it's wonderful. And we were about to go for it, um, and we noticed an avalanche had come down the route. And, um, you know, like it, it, it had just, it had just uh, released his, uh, the, the avalanche. And two weeks prior to that, three climbers had actually lost their lives on that same route. So as bad as we wanted to climb that mountain, we had worked so hard to get there, just the logistics, the, the, the physical um, the physical challenges to get there. And then there's an avalanche. So we actually waited. We're like, maybe we'll climb it tomorrow. And then there's another avalanche. And we actually ended up, ended up bailing because it just wasn't safe enough. And although we could have probably climbed it and there wouldn't have been, you know, we wouldn't have yeah. been buried in an avalanche or something, it, the, it's just kind of a gamble. And it's like, I want to take calculated risks and not foolish risks. And, you know, I want to not only climb, but kind of do all kinds of at risk or, or action sports, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And if I'm not calculated and wise, then I probably won't be able to. Yeah, you can't really argue with an avalanche, can you? It's <laughs> it's not very forgiving. Well, and I'm sure your mum would be happy to hear that. that you're not taking too risk, <laughs> well, too listen many to us, would you? Make, yeah. sure, make sure you keep in touch with her and um, keep us in the loop on what you're up to. Yeah, are you, you're uh, publishing your photographs as you go along. Can we? Can the listeners follow you somewhere? I am. I'm working with a number of brands and sponsors. So there's kind of like stories um, that are getting published through these different platforms. I'm a little dormant on my personal website at the moment just because living off a motorcycle is pretty hard, as you can imagine, to find electricity and power and, and service. It was actually pretty hard to find service just to hop on the call. <laughs> yeah. um, but post-trip, I'm hoping to publish a book as well as publish the stories from this trip on my site and through uh, the brands and, and companies that I'm working with. So as time goes on, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of easier ways to kind of see the stories and images from this trip as, as well as others. Awesome, James. Thanks for that. Firstly, an update. We said at the beginning of the podcast that he was about to embark from Alaska to uh, Patagonia. Patagonia. Yep. He's actually finished that. With that his was mates. quick. Yeah. <laughs> 
took about 18 minutes. <laughs> you know, we were, this is at the time of us recording. He's now selling though, Phil. This is enough to make you shed a tear. His beloved 1996 Suzuki DR650 in Chile, and he says if you're looking for a moto trip through the Americas, then say no more. Buy, swap and sell on the World No Man's <laughs> podcast. There you go. Well, it's well run in now. You win it. It'll probably know its own way if you want to do that. True. We'll have a photo of it too. Oh, and okay, we'll put, yeah, it, put it in the show notes. There's never been a better opportunity to uh, swing across to iTunes and subscribe to the World No Man's podcast because once you subscribe and rate and leave a comment – we're going to take the comment that we like the best, and we're going to give away a copy of that book. Oh, giveaways and buy, swap and sell. <laughs> Hit the road. Vans, Nomads and Roadside Adventures. It's a beautiful book as well, by the way. Yeah, oh, it's, it, look, it's as I said gorgeous. at the beginning of the podcast, it truly is inspiring. and It's, it's one of those, they call them coffee table books. Sure. But it's so much more than that. You, you really do. You pick it up and you, this is the adventure I want to do. Yeah. The next time you pick it up, no, nah, actually, I think this is the adventure that I want to do. And I build my own pot belly stove in my camper van. <laughs> That's, That's it. That's it. Next week, our amazing Nomad series continues with Mike Dawson, a Kiwi kayaker who funded his own Olympic dream. Wait until you hear how. But it's not just the competition courses that he tackles. His adventurous side has Mike kayaking some of the wildest rivers in the world. He's our amazing Nomad next week. See you then. Bye. Bye. Amazing Nomads. Be inspired.